joining us online, welcome to Hope Point. Um, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. That's in the New Testament. Hit Matthew, take a right, go about 15 books in. You're going to run at Hebrews, Hebrews 11, chapter 1. This is a new series called the Hall of Faith. Everybody say faith. faith. you got to have faith. Faith, faith, faith. Uh, I think faith oftentimes today is kind of a dirty word because uh, we live in a society that says, um, I'll believe it if I see it, prove it to me, the scientific method, Aristotelian logic, that kind of thing. You got you to gotta see it through. And um, while there's nothing wrong with some of that, I believe that faith is one of the most important things that a believer can have. Without faith, it's impossible to please God in it doesn't really matter what atheistic writer you read, whether it's Stephen Hawking or Tyson DeGrasse or anybody, when they talk about the origin of the universe, they all land in a similar place, and that is we can't explain the things that made all of this happen. We can explain that. It was God, and He spoke a word. Unfortunately, with evidence, most people try to see it, but if you think about the origin of how we got here, Hebrews says that God spoke the world, that what was created was made out of nothing, that he spoke. So many people are looking for a substance for proof when they should be looking for a sound. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so I think that it's so critical that we examine this because what I believe is that we're on the cusp of the greatest spiritual harvest the world has ever seen. I believe more people are going to come to know Christ in, the, in this time than ever before. And God is going to do signs, wonders, and miracles in and through your life. And I think he wants to do more through you. And the reality is, is that in order for that to happen, there has to be an elevation of faith. Now, the Bible says that, that, that it is not in your ability or your understanding, your spiritual pedigree. It is not in uh, how you were raised, but, but you just have to have a little bit of this element. You don't even have to have a lot of it. Jesus said if you just have faith as small as a mustard seed, right? Smallest of seeds grows into one of the biggest of garden plants. If you just have faith as small as that, you can say mountain be removed and it will be cast into the sea. I believe that faith is what gets us there. Everybody say faith. faith. Come on, have you say faith a lot today. I want to get in your spirit. I want to speak to your spirit, not your head today. I want you to realize that God has something bigger. Say God has bigger. Come on, say bigger. Bigger, bigger faith, bigger plans. And I believe today that it's important that you recognize who you are in the DNA, the bloodline of faith that you have. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a spiritual ancestry.com through this Hebrews 11 because it talks about the great men and women of faith. But I want you to check your bloodline and your ancestry of faith because when you examine it, what you're going to see is that your faith didn't come to you on your own, but that it was passed down to you from faithful people. All right? So faithful people followed and believed. I remember I was reading this story uh, not that long ago about a young lady who was adopted from West Africa named Sarah. And Sarah was adopted uh, by a white family here in West Virginia. The, the dad was a neurobiology professor at West Virginia University. And Sarah grew up, and at a certain point, she realized that she looked different than her mom and dad. So she said, I, you know, how did I get here, all that? And they said, well, we adopted you from West Africa. And that's uh, particularly meaningful to us because we've planted many churches and built two schools in West Africa, namely Ghana and Nigeria. And so she was from a different country called Sierra Leone, but... Um, her family adopted her because of the civil war that had broken out there. Most of the country was decimated, not only financially and economically, mentally, morally, every, every which way. Um, so many people lost their lives in that war, that conflict. It was a civil war. And so Sarah was adopted, brought over, and as she began to search for her parents, she found out something amazing. This has been written in a book and will be produced as a movie soon. Sarah found out that she she was a princess, and that she was actually uh, Sierra Leonean royalty, and not just of a small clan, but of a tribe that was so big it comprised 33% of her nation. And so Sarah um, 
met brothers she didn't know she had parents she didn't know that she had and um, as she went she saw the devastation in her country started a nonprofit and built wells for water built schools for education and did remarkable work in her country and is still doing that and it struck me very uniquely because I saw in her story the story of every believer which is it's amazing when you find out who you really are. Because who you really are indicates what you can really do. And if you look, if you don't know who you, where you come from, then you don't know who you really are or what, where you're headed. If you look at your bloodline, you'll begin to see that. We don't know what our birthright is. Sarah discovered her birthright as a princess as she looked at her bloodline and what her rights were. So put up the other slide. In, in discovering this, we did, and when we discover who we are, it gives us not only identity, but it gives us rights as people that are a part of the kingdom of God, children of God. It gives us authority to operate and work in and change our community. It gives us purpose and hones our direction for what God has called us to do, and discovering all of that gives us family. I think it's phenomenal that the Bible, every time it describes the church, it uses words like body of Christ, bride of Christ, family of God. Those are all organism words. They're living, the church is not a building, it's not an organization, it is an organism. It's a living, breathing thing. It means that now, now every organism has to have organization or, organization or it comes out wonky, it's unhealthy. But every organism is a living, breathing thing. And if you're new to faith, if you've been in faith for a while, you're new to faith, maybe you haven't tried faith out yet, you join a family when you come into faith. And 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 we're 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 a little weird. We're 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 not perfect. We're not try, we're not claiming to be. But what we are are sinners saved by grace, allowing God to work on us each and every day, hopefully. So so it's uh, we're, we're, if you come into church and you say those people aren't perfect, you're starting to get the point, right? But but there's this foundation that she found, and I want us in this series to discover our roots, to discover our foundation, to discover our heritage and faith, so that we can know our identity, our rights, our authority, our purpose, and who our family really is. And in discovering that, it's going to release a power in your life to pursue God and all that He has for you to transform the community and the family around you. So if you've got your Bibles, Hebrews 11.1. 1. We're going to dive into this quick uh, because I know it's important for you to get what we need to say so that you can quickly apply it. And I'm going to, this is the part of class that's participatory, all right? So I'm going to actually have you do some reading with me today because I think it's critical that as you speak the word, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. Some, 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 some people in here have been to church before. Faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. So what does that mean? It means that as you hear the word of God, if you, if you want faith to grow in your life, read the word of God. Listen to the word of God. Because if you, if you need faith for your finances, then, then read what the Word of God says about finance. If you need faith for healing, then read what the Word of God says about healing. I love the fact that all of God's promises are yes. are yes. There's so many promises, they're yes and amen. Amen means let it be, so let it be. So all of God's promises are yes and so let it be. For every believer, doesn't matter if you're just joining this thing or you've been in it a while, all of God's promises are yes for you. So here's Here's, here's the, the underline. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. As, as I was young and learning this, uh, the, the, the way that, that I memorized it was, fa now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you see that substance is something that you can grab onto, but it's substance of something that's hoped for. How can you grab onto something that you're hoping for? It's evidence of something I don't see. The very word evidence means foresight. So how do I see what is not yet seen? 
And this right here is one of the most beautiful passages in my mind in Scripture. Now faith, now let's, I want you to read it out. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. One more time, like you believe it. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. You mean they weren't commended for their skill. They weren't commended for their ability. They weren't commended for their spiritual pedigree. They weren't commended because their grandfather went to church and built the church. They weren't commended because uh, of, of what they knew scripturally. No, they were commended for one thing. Faith. They didn't earn it. They didn't buy it. They received it. Now, faith has this implicit definition that James gives us, and it's faith without works is dead. So faith always entails action. It's never passive. And very often we think of faith as a mental acknowledgement of a set of values or beliefs. But that's not accurate. You, there is an access to that, but faith has always been about the application and the pursuit and the active engagement of our life in conjunction with what God has revealed about himself in Scripture. It has never been about saying, well, yes, I believe I did check the religion box on, box on Facebook, and I am Christian. It, is, it has never been about your label. It has always been about your lifestyle. Faith. Everybody say faith. Faith in, in Greek is pistis. That's the word. It means to expect, to look for a strong and welcome conviction. I, I, I want you to get this image clearly. The, one of the best definitions of faith, if you look at the Hebrew, it literally means I'm inclining my neck like this. That I am looking for something that I know and am assured of is coming. It is not a passive hope that maybe this will happen. It is actively looking for God and his purpose and his work and his plan in my life. It is not going, I hope he shows up. Here, here's the best analogy I can, I can give you. I see my uncle with the white hair sitting here today. Will you wave your hand, Uncle Warren? Yep, yep. Uh, everybody say hi, Uncle Warren. Hi, Uncle Warren. Uh, uncle, my uncle Warren is... Um, it, it, is uh, 80 years old. I, I think he's, yeah, he turned 80 in March. Uh, he, um, he grew up Baptist, real Baptist. Coming to our church was a big change. We, have, we don't have pews, we have chairs. We don't have robes, we, ha we don't have a choir, we have a band, we have all that stuff. But he started coming and getting actively involved about six or seven years ago. And absolutely amazing. I am amazed to watch him serve the Lord in our church. Phenomenal. Um, he and my aunt did not have any children. So me and my sister Amy and my sister Ashley and my brother David um, all were kind of their kids. And, and I remember, how many of you remember Christmas? Anybody remember as a kid? As a parent, you're trying to forget something? I'm just like, but as a kid, do you remember the feeling of presents and trees and anticipation and all of this stuff? I, I remember uh, as, at Christmas, my uncle and aunt would always pull up. My uncle almost has always driven a white car. He would, he would pull up 
and he and my aunt, they rolled super deep. Like, they brought us so many presents, it was ridiculous. And I love you for it. I still love you for it. But they, they would pull up, and, and Christmas wasn't Christmas until they got there. And, and here's what would happen. They would pop open the trunk, and they would pull out, like, stacks of presents. And, I mean, it were so many presents, you couldn't see their faces. It was amazing. And I was always at the window, <laughs> as were my siblings, Waiting for them to come because I knew that they had good things for me and probably some clothes I didn't want to. But good, good things for me. And, and this is what I want to tell you. This is the difference between active and passive faith. Passive faith sits on the couch on Christmas and says, I hope that somebody comes with something for me. Active faith gets up, goes to the window, looks out, and says, I'm looking because I know they're coming. They've always shown up, and they always will. God's promises are always good. He's always going to show up because he loves you. He cares about you. He believes in you. And he wants to bring good things into your life. We serve a God that leans in, not leans back. There is a difference in this level of faith. Too many people are laying back going, I hope God does. And God is saying, that's not faith. Faith is looking out the window going, oh, I know they're coming. Oh, I know they're coming. And he's got so many good things for me. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. And we couldn't possibly contain them. God is so good that that I have an assurance that I have inclined my neck, that I'm looking for provision, I'm looking for healing, but more importantly, I'm looking for him. He's my reward. There's something to this thing we call faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith to where you are looking for, then I will always show up. Too often, we are looking back. Brad, go back behind the curtain. I need five more minutes. (laughs) Go. Whenever Brad comes out, I know my time has come. If you're going to sit there, play something to make me sound good. Everybody say, being sure. This is hypostasis. This word means thing, a, a, a substance, a foundation under you. And what it really has the connotation of is a legal document that, that proves that the property that you're standing on belongs to you. So let me, let me just put that in context. When you have faith that makes you look for God showing up and all the good things, showing up in your marriage, showing up in your children, showing up on your job, showing up in your community, showing up in your healing, showing up in your provision. When God shows up, you are looking for him and you have a foundation, a reason for doing so. That there is a legal document that you have that says, I have the right and the access to look for everything that God has for me. What's the legal document? It's a document that was signed in blood, church, the blood of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, to those that know him. He wrote that document in blood, and he said, they're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Man, that is good. I'm preaching myself happy today. It's so good. Because you know what? God wants you to see that you are not hopelessly looking for something. But there is a legal contract that heaven signed 2,000 years ago that said sin no longer has access to you. That says Satan no longer has dominion over you. 
that says hell cannot be a destination for a believer. That says abundant and eternal life is provision given for all those that have accepted Christ Jesus and believe, have faith, engaged, are looking for him. That, that that document says that you can have healing in your body. That document says that, that you are co-heirs with Christ. That, that in salvation you have the rights to all of the children of God, to royalty. You can change nations with that kind of royalty. We, we, we become kings and priests. It's a legal contract and we can have assurance that God has a legal claim to us in the court of justice, the divine court of law. That is, justice has been satisfied on our behalf because of Christ Jesus. That's the document. That is the foundation upon which we stand. And I'm going to tell you, that original document was, was signed in blood through the Bible. And the Bible included the prophets. All If you, if you look back, Jacob, 1,500 years before Christ is born, I see a king, a rising, a scepter coming out of Judah. You look 800 years before at Isaiah, who prophesies uh, more about Christ than any other prophet. He sees his suffering. He sees his birth. He sees his virgin birth. You look at Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and they're all prophesying about Jesus. You see them prophesying all the way 400 years before Christ, and Jesus fulfills all of these 400 prophecies, many that he couldn't control, where he would be born, to whom he would be born. All of these things are fulfilled in him. We are not hopelessly believing. There were eyewitnesses accounts of the post-resurrection ministry of Jesus. Up to 10 different accounts. 500 saw him go up. Paul said he came to me as one abnormally born on the road to Damascus. He walked a seven mile journey on Emmaus with Clovis and the other disciple. He appeared to Jesus, to John the Baptist. He appeared and Thomas touched him. He wasn't some Casper. He didn't eat food that they watched go through him. He was real. We have all of the eyewitness accounts. The promises of God. I love this passage of scripture. If you're taking notes, I'm going to read it and close. It's 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. We didn't follow cleverly invented stories. This is Peter, who would later be martyred for, for Christ. When we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses to his ministry. We, didn't, we were there when he received glory and honor from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain and we have the word of the prophets made more certain and you do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the, dawn, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See, church, we have a great reason for faith. But we still have to have faith. And despite all of that evidence, despite all of these things, you have to decide, yeah, that God just doesn't do it for, for the Bible. He doesn't just do it for others, but he will do it for you. Faith is personal. There will come a time, I promise you, I've not been pastoring that long, 20 years. But one thing I can tell you is everybody will hit a faith wall. And your faith will either be real or it won't be. And the reason I know that is because you and I are all going to die. I know that's revelation to some of us, particularly under the age of 20, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You'll find if your faith is real then. Because the reality is, I don't know about you, but as soon as I breathe my last, my next is in the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. That's just a simple door. I wonder if we really believe and we're looking for. I can always tell people that believe in eternity. They live their life so differently on earth. Can, can I just encourage you today? Believe that you get to invest 
and forever. Now, believe that the only commodity of heaven is those you bring with you. Your family, your friends, your co-workers, your community. Believe that heaven is so real that God died for it. So that we could live in it with him. Please believe and please look forward to all that he has for you. It's going to be a great series. I'm so excited. You can tell I'm probably a little little excited. But I hope that your faith in him grows. Would you bow your head? Close your eyes. No peeking. I'm going to pray for your faith. I'm specifically going to pray for those that need it. As our prayer team comes up, we will have people here to specifically pray for you. And I really challenge you to take them up on it. Some of you really need prayer personally. But I want to just ask that person in the room. Do you know Christ? I mean, really know him. The Bible says that demons believe in Jesus and they shudder. Belief is not the only thing. There's an acknowledgement of surrender, of repentance, that says, I believe, therefore I repent and I surrender. Today, I would love for you to repent and surrender and live abundant and eternal life in Christ. If you're watching online, there's a button that you can hit. But if you're here today, there's a button you can hit, and it's your hand to say, I would like to start a relationship with Jesus and exercise my faith. Faith is being implanted into people right now as they hear my voice. Right now, as they hear my voice. So I'm just going to count to three, and I want you to raise your hand. And we're all going to help you and say a prayer. But it's important that you acknowledge that you have said it so that God will acknowledge you. If you would like to have your sin forgiven and your slate wiped clean, we've all got it. I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to count to three, and then I want you to say, that's me, Pastor. And you're just going to pray from your seat. One, if you'd like to have abundant and eternal life that only Jesus Christ can offer and connect you back to your Creator, I want you to raise your hand. Two, finally, if you'd like to know your Savior, if you'd like to really, really know him and be assured and look for all that he has for you, then I want you to raise your hand three right now. Just put them up nice and high. So good. Thank you. Yes, yes. Come on, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Come on. There's other people too, I know. Keep putting up those hands. I don't want you to leave without your hand going up. It's important. Come on, let's clap for them. Let's clap for them. Let's clap for them. You just made the best decision you could ever make. And we're going to say a prayer, all all of us together. Say, dear God, I come to you today with my sin. You're the only answer. I ask you to forgive me. I repent. I come to you believing in Jesus. That he paid a price I couldn't. And that he rose again so that I could be with God forever. Today, Jesus, I give you my life and I make you my Lord and my Savior. I promise to serve you all my days. In Jesus' name.